Presence of the Lord, turn um, with me in your Bible to Isaiah 61, and we will begin there. Uh, we are in a series of lessons and a theme for our current assignment that the Lord has given us is revitalize. And uh, we know that God wants to revitalize us internally on the inside. He wants to do a work in us, and he wants to do a work through us. He wants to do a work in us, and he wants to do a work through us. Maybe I should say it like this. He's doing a work in us, and he's doing a work through us. He, he, he can't do it himself. He does it through people. Isaiah 61, verse 1. You have it? Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. It's always interesting here to look who Jesus was anointed to help. The poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, those, that's his target audience. At one point, they got mad because he spent too much time with prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors. And he said, it's not those that are well that need a doctor. It's those that are sick. Amen? Amen. So if you got something going on in your life today, guess what? Jesus is anointed to help you. I'm anointed to help you. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In some translations, it, calls to pro it says to proclaim the year of grace and favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's been scientifically proven that when you praise God, it does something in your physical body. You can come in here heavy. That's why the enemy don't want you to lift your hands and praise God, because he knows stuff breaks off of you when you do that. So he tries to get you heavy, come in here heavy, leave heavy. That's a lie of the enemy. You got to come ready to pray. You got to come ready to worship. You got to come ready to lift your hands. And the best way to do that is to do it elsewhere. If the only time is you praise God is Sunday morning at 9.30 to 9.45 or not, you, 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 your deck is not all the way stacked. Everybody say, I'm a praiser. To give us the oil of joy for morning and the garment of praise. How many of you know the spirit of heaviness is real? And what is God's solution according to this scripture for the uh, spirit of heaviness? The garment of what? Praise. That they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, shout revitalize. They shall raise up the former desolations, shout revitalize. They shall repair the ruined city, shout revitalize. So our assignment is to what? Revitalize. All right. So we've been talking in this series of revitalization. We talked about the ABCs of faith, how we can strategically target our faith for promises in the word of God, how we can also hear God and out of boldness and out of obedience to God, do what he tells us to do without full understanding. And we can be blessed that way. We can use our faith on behalf of others so that other people's lives can be blessed. But the bottom line is all the promises of God are received by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, above all, taking the shield of faith. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Matter of fact, there was a lady and she came and it wasn't like Jesus told her, you know what made you well today? My power made, that's not what he said. He said, your faith has made you whole. There were some lepers, 10 of them. And they came to Jesus to get healed. All of them got healed. Nine left, one came back. He said, now wait, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Those that knew better, the Jewish lepers, should have known to come back and give God praise. The one that came back was not. He said, not only are you going to be healed, you're going to be made whole. Your faith will make you whole. And once we're made whole, what does God want us to do? Make someone else whole, right? Everybody say, I lead. So when we talk about leading, it's because God wants others to have what we have. 
And the way that he does that is through his people. One man awake awakens another. The second awakens his next door brother. The three awake can rattle the town by turning the whole place upside down. The many awake can cause such a fuss, it finally awakens all the rest of us. One man up with dawn in his eyes, surely then multiply. How many does it take? One. How many am I asking you to bring? One. One. Jesus went after one, the woman at the well. Matter of fact, he said, if you got a hundred sheep and you lose one and you still got 99, won't you leave the 99 and go after the, the one? Everybody say, I'm the one. Yeah, you're the one today. You're the one today. Everybody say, I'm the one. I'm the only one. That's how you got to look at it. Don't look at it as someone else is going to do it. Look at it as God is counting on me to do it. And if I don't do it, it won't be done. Say, I'm the one. So we're in a series of, and this is the introductory lesson continued from last week. I lead, and we understand that leadership is very important. Turn with me in your Bible to Matthew 20, verse 28. Matthew 20, verse 28. Everybody say, I lead. Now, as a tendency as a pastor, when God gives me something to, uh, to uh, teach the word of God on or teach the congregation on, as he gives that to me, I want to, you know, start looking through books and things like that. Well, the first book I need to look at is the Bible. Before I get the commentary, before I go to the leadership gurus, before I go to the premier leader of leadership in the body of Christ and in the world, before I do all that, I got to go see what the word of God says about leadership and then add those other things to it. Do you have Matthew 20? Look at verse 28. It says, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons. M Matthew 20. Verse 20. OK, we've been seem to having this problem these last couple Sundays. Matthew 20, 20. Matthew 20, 20. Are you with me? Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared for my for my father. Verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased. They were heated with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give him a give his life as a ransom for many. So we looked at Jesus. This is what I call the leadership crisis. This is a leadership crisis right in Jesus camp. Have you ever had a leadership crisis in your camp, in your family, on your job? Well, Jesus had one. If we look at how he handled his, it'll give us a model for how we can handle ours. Number one, Jesus called a leadership meeting. He called everybody together so they could all get on the same page. So the first thing he did was he called this leadership meeting. The second thing he did, this is a review, he corrected the leader's thinking. That's in verse 25, where he said the Gentiles operate this day. They wanted to operate the same way they saw people in the world operate when it came to leadership. He was like, no, 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 no. I know this is what you've seen, and I know this is what you do now, but let me correct your thinking. Let me show you a different way to think. Let me show you a different way to lead. Everybody say, I lead. So number two, he corrects their thinking. Then number three, he cast his own leadership vision in order to reverse what they'd seen in the world. He said, if you want to be a great, you got to serve. If you want to be first, you got to be a slave. 
He corrected their thinking on the spot. Amen. Amen. And then number, uh, the fourth thing he did, he clarified why he came. Now, you would think the son of man came to be served. He corrected them and said, I didn't come to be served. I've come to serve. Matter of fact, later on, he demonstrated service. How did he do that? He washed feet. He washed feet. So Jesus is our example. He calls a meeting. He corrects their thinking. He casts the correct leadership vision. He clarifies why he came so that everyone, I don't want you just to, I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to show you. I'm going to tell you to serve and then I'm going to show you how to serve. And then finally, Jesus concludes the way to get up is by going down. The way to be promoted is by humbling yourself. He said, if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will lift you up. So when we look at leadership, it's a combination of following and leading. Right. And I gave my example last week about a store. If I'm buying, if I, if I want to start a, a hair product store, the goal is for me to sell. But I can't sell until I first buy the product to sell. And the better I am at buying at a deep discount, the, and matter, matter of fact, the better, thank you, Holy Ghost, the better I am at buying, I don't even really have to do anything, but it's going to sell itself. If, if I'm really good at buying, and I can buy mine cheaper than everyone else can, and people come in my store and be like, I like your prices, I don't have to ask or not, they're going to go, they're going to be like, there's this new store open, they're selling that same hair for cheaper. So the better that buying is going to make it easier to sell. Listen to me. I'm not talking about buying and selling. I'm talking about leading and following. The better I am at following is going to make it easier for me to lead. Everybody say, I lead. Say, come on, say, I lead. Leadership is everywhere. It's in everything. We see it in family. We see it in business. We see it in education. We see it in arts, entertainment, sports, government. Leadership is critical. We are called to lead. We are called to serve. Now, when we talk about what Jesus did as a leader, we can uh, hone in on what he wants us to do. The number first, well, not number one, but it is number one, but it's the first thing. The first thing that Jesus did as a leader was Jesus saw things others didn't see. Write that down. Jesus saw things others didn't see. If we're going to lead, we have to see things that others did not see. John 4, 35, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, what's another word for behold? Look, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white unto harvest. They were waiting. They said, four months, we should be good. And God is saying, when? Now. I need you to go after your one when? Now. He said, the harvest is ripe. It's the fields are ripe unto harvest. So when everyone, is, everybody I invite, don't come. Listen, God is working on their hearts right now. I'm telling you, he is working on their hearts right now. The Bible says that the fields are ripe unto harvest. I believe people are going to start coming to you and inviting themselves to church. You're going to walk in here and see your coworker sitting here and be like, what you doing here? You don't want me to be here? You're going to be surprised at who walks through those doors. So Jesus saw things that others didn't see. There is no excuse for anyone in here not to have your mind one because the fields are white. I see white fields. What do you see? I said, I see white fields. What do you see? I see a harvest that's white. What do you see? Do you see what I see? Say, I see what you see. Say, I lead. Well, lead it. All right. Jesus looked up in the tree and he saw Zacchaeus. Turn to Luke, the 19th chapter. He saw things in people that they did not see in themselves. If we're going to lead, we have to see things that others do not see. You have Luke 19, verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. Let me let me let me say something right here. 
There are poor people that need Jesus and there are rich people that need Jesus. We have a tendency to focus on the poor people that need Jesus, but the rich people need Jesus too. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, said he was very rich, but he had a hole in his heart that only Jesus could fill. So we're going after everybody, the rich and the poor, the up and the down. Amen? Amen. So don't just try to, you know, people that are broken and stuff like that. You might have some rich co-workers. The harvest is ripe. The fields are white. Amen? Amen. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Go. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Jesus saw something in Zacchaeus that others didn't see, and that's what leaders do. I want you to see things in people that others don't see. Why? Because you lead. Everybody say, I lead. I want you to see in other people things that don't people don't see in them. Why? Because you lead. And leaders do what? See things that others do not see. He saw it in Peter before Peter got gone. He said, Peter, you're going to deny me. He saw that. He's like, no, Lord, you know I'm good. You know I got no. No, I'm serious, Peter. You're going to deny. Jesus saw something in Peter. Matter of fact, he said, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. On, my, on this rock, I build my church. He saw something in Peter others didn't see. He saw something in Zacchaeus that others didn't see. He saw things in tax collectors and sinners that others didn't see. Let's turn to uh, Luke 17. Are you in Luke 19? Turn back a page or two. Everybody say, I lead, because I see. Say it again, I lead. Say, I lead. Say, I lead, because I see. Luke 17, look at verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria in Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not only any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus saw something in those lepers that others didn't see. You know, they were outcasts. They, they couldn't even come into town. They couldn't go by. It was, it was contagious. So if they came in contact with people, the people would get it. So all the lepers just lived together. Jesus went right up in the middle of them. He saw something in them that they didn't see in themselves. He did what he had to do, and these people's lives were transformed. So Jesus always sees things that all others don't see. He always sees things in people that others don't see. They needed something. So one boy here, two fish, five loaves. Jesus saw something in it. He was in the middle of a storm. They were looking at the storm. What did Jesus see? He saw a calm sea. Lazarus was dead. He said, I mean, they ain't dead. What you talking about? Jesus saw Lazarus back alive. Everybody say, I lead and I see what others don't see. Jesus told Peter, let's turn there, Matthew 4. Matthew 4. Everybody say, I'm a leader. Matthew 4. Look at verse 18. Matthew 4, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, do what? Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. He said, I want you to follow me, but ultimately, when I'm gone, you're going to Right? He said, I'm not going to teach you how to lead. I'm going to teach you how to follow. And as you learn how to 
follow, that's your preparation for you being a leader. He said, I'm going to show you the step of being a good follower. And that will cause you to be a great leader. What verse did I leave off on? What verse did I leave off on? Look at verse 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. What is he doing? He's training some leaders, but he's first training them how to follow. When God wanted to lead Abram out, the first thing he did, he said, Abram, look up from the place where you are right now. He wanted to show him something else. He said, look north, look south, look east, and look west. That's Genesis 13. He said, man, I want to lead you out of there, but I can't lead you with your head down. I can't lead you looking down. I need you to look up. Everybody say, look up. Come on, say, look up. God needs us to look up and to see what he sees so that we can lead. Lead within the context of our church. Lead within the context of our families. Lead within the context of the community. Lead on our job. He wants us to lead. When God wanted Abraham to show him and to develop this nation, the first thing he told him was to look up. He said, I'm giving this land to you and your descendants. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by, one translation says, believing and not seeing. Turn to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, and the 18th verse. 2 Corinthians 4 and 18. I'm getting there. 2 Corinthians 4.18. Jesus saw things that others didn't see. We're created in his image and his likeness. As he is, so are we. So we see things that others don't see. When other people are pulling their hair out, we see the end result. We see that we're, we're solution oriented, not problem. We understand that we can pray and God can do supernatural things. We understand that we can target our faith and God can do supernatural things. So when things in the natural are not looking like what they should be looking like, we don't start sweating. We see what God sees. That's the end result. Victory. We see beyond the cross. We see beyond crucifixion to a resurrected Jesus. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God, God our Father. Everybody say, I see. Say it again, I see. Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter in the 16th verse. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed. How often? How often? Day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So how many things are there too? Those that we can see, those that we can't. The visible and the invisible. There are two worlds we live in. What are you talking about? You even understand that when it comes to your cell phone, your remote control, or anything else. There are two worlds that we live in. There's a spiritual world and there is a natural world. There is a visible world and there is an invisible world. And if we're going to be able to lead and be effective in the things of God, you know what we have to do? We have to see not only what's in the natural realm, but we also need to see what's in the spirit realm. Well, how do I do that, Pastor Roland? By reading the word of God. God tells us what's going on in that realm, the activity that's going on in that realm, in his word. It's already done. Amen? Amen. So we got things that we can see and things that we cannot see. We're not just focusing on those that we can see. We're also focused on those that we cannot see. Now, Jesus was trying to hone in on his leadership lesson, and he did that by asking an important question. Turn to Luke 6. What time is it? Luke 6. Everybody say, I lead. I know you do. Luke 6. Verse 39. Luke 6, verse 39. Jesus kind of clarifies, gives us a little more focus and clarity on the leadership that he was um, displaying by asking a question in verse 39. And he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? 
So Jesus is telling us if the leader is blind and the follower is blind, they both end up in a ditch. So the leader has got to be able to see so that those that are blind can be led by the leader that can see. Everybody say, I lead, I see. Say it again, I lead, I see. Can a blind man guide and direct a blind man? Will they not both stumble into a ditch or a hole in the ground? And then it goes on to say in verse 40, a pupil, this is the uh, amplified translation, a pupil is not superior to his teacher, but everyone, when he is completely trained, readjusted, restored, set to rights and perfect, will be like his teacher. All right? You know what I'm praying for you? Did someone say what? No one said what? You know what I'm praying for you? I'm, I'm, pray, I'm praying that God will help you see. I'm praying that God would help you see, number one, and I'm praying that God would help you see what I see. You know what I'm praying for me? You know what I'm praying for me? I'm praying that God would help me see what he sees. So I'm praying that God would help me see what he sees. I'm praying that for me. I'm praying that God would help you see what I see. So if I see what God sees and you see what I see, we all see the same thing. I need to say it slower. I'm praying that God would help me see what he sees. And I'm praying that you would help, God would help you see me what I see. And if I see what God sees and you see what I see, we all see what God sees. Everybody say, ah, I see, I see, I see. <laughs> Don't want to say, I see, 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 I see. Turn with me to Acts 16. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Pastor Marisa, you're going to enjoy this. Acts 16. I see, I see. Somebody got to see we're all going to end up in a ditch. Amen? Acts 16. Now, man, we, man has um, uh, various levels of purpose. Every human being... On the face of the earth, mankind has a universal purpose. Everybody here on the face of the earth was created for the purpose, one main purpose of glorifying God. Okay? Of glorifying God. That's the universal purpose. Then there's the united purpose of the body of Christ to carry out God's will in the earth. Okay? To carry out God's will in the earth. And then the last uh, purpose is a unique purpose. That's the reason why you specifically are here. Okay? So you got the universal purpose. That's the purpose for every human being, mankind on the face of the earth. Then you've got a united purpose. That's the purpose for the body of Christ. And then you've got a unique purpose. That's the reason that you specifically were purpose, what God has called you to. All right. And we're going to give you some clarity on that here in Acts, the 16th chapter. And let's look at the sixth verse, Acts 16 and 6. Now, when they had gone through Fergia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Sound like a dead end to me, right? They tried to go somewhere. Holy Ghost was like, eh, eh. Verse 7. After they had come to Messiah, they tried to go into Bethina, but the Spirit did not permit them. Okay, so now this is the second dead end that they run into. All right? Verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. All right? So Paul tried to go two places, both places, dead end, red light, blockade, couldn't go. Then all of a sudden, God opened up Paul's eyes, and he had a vision. Now he is able to see. All right? So now they're ready to go. He's able to see. All right? He said, come over to Macedonia and help us. Verse 10. Now, after he had seen the vision, Immediately we, underline that in your Bible if it's not underlined. After he saw the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel there. Who saw the vision? Paul. Who showed it to him? God showed Paul the vision. He was trying to figure out what's my next move, where do we need to go. God shows Paul this vision. Paul communicates the vision to the people, and they weren't like, that's good, Paul. Go for it, man. 
they took hold of the vision that God had shown Paul. How do I know that? Because it said immediately now, verse 10. Now, after he, that's singular, that's one person. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately I be the he, you be the we. Yeah? Who I be? Who you be? I be the he, you be the we, and we're all following God. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. It's all about them. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about we. It's about them. It's about everybody from California to Union and Brundage to Chester. That is our Jerusalem. That is the area that God has called us to. That is our divine assignment. It's not about us. It's about them. God showed him the vision. He cast the vision. They were like, let's go. Let go now. God just called us. Everybody say, I leave. He called all of them, but the message came through Paul, and they were willing. Now, Paul, you done said twice, let's go. We followed you over there, that didn't work. We followed you over there, that didn't work. And now you're saying you have a vision, because you know we ain't going. We give you two good no's, and after that, we're good. So we know what you did. You ain't had no vision, Paul. You making that up, because you know we ain't going nowhere. They all together. Decided, this is what God has for us. Let's move forward. You know, one of the greatest uh, gospel singers that I remember uh, growing up, Yolanda Adams. I don't know. Anyway, but she, she sung, I would say she wrote a song, she may not have wrote it, but she showed it singing. And it says like this, before I tell them, Lord, please tell me, before I serve them, Lord, please serve me. How can I lead where I've not been? How can I show if I don't know? Before I tell them, Lord, please tell me. Before I teach them, Lord, please teach me. Before I reach out to them, Lord, reach out to me. How can I lead where I've not been? How can I show if I don't know before I tell them, Lord, please tell me. Everybody say, I lead. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful and grateful. I want to thank all of you that are joining us by way of Compassion Online, um, whether that be Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or Facebook Live. I'd like to welcome all of you and thank all of you for joining us today. If you live here locally and you like what's going on online, telling you it's even better here in person.